cheering at D. Okay. Thank you, Paul. And uh, like Greg, I want to begin by acknowledging Abby Backen's efforts both in organizing this panel, but some of you in the room will know that Abby has essentially created a small industry in the promotion of John Riddell's work uh, <laughs> in publishing the Proceedings of the Communist International. Uh, and it has been, the results are, are in front of us today. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge this is an incredible life's work that John has carried through with the assistance of other friends and comrades like Mike, uh, who has been indispensable uh, to, to this recent work. And I want to say a word or two about translation at the outset, because we talk about it sometimes as a purely literary operation. One translates documents in Russian or German or French or Italian into, in this case, English. But I think John is aware that he's taken on a bigger task here, which is to raise the question of the translation of particular experiences in the revolutionary history of the international working class movement into our contemporary moment. And he knows, I believe, this touches on Paul, one of Paul's concluding points, that as Walter Benjamin said, translation is not a literal exercise. Every translation experientially opens up new possibilities and revisits and reworks uh, older ones. And I think it's that sense in which we want to talk about the legacies of revolutionary socialism that John is really plunging us into. And these are, this is a seething cauldron of debate. <laughs> the idea that this was a monolithic movement is utterly shattered as soon as you start reading these debates. There are tendencies, currents, uh, and so on, countering one another in uh, one way after another. So we're not talking about imitation. There's lots of people who think mimicry is the task. If only I can look like Lenin or Trotsky, uh, and try to act like them, then somehow we will conjure a revolutionary organization into being. Well, I think most of us recognize that that's not how things work. Uh, having said that, though, we need to productively engage our history, because one of the risks for small, marginalized socialist politics today is that we lose contact with past legacies and past traditions, that we don't understand that they could have some value in making sense of our world today. I would love to spend time on the discussions of colonialism and the Eastern question. Uh, I think these are hugely important and maybe we'll get other occasions uh, to do that. But like Paul, I want to talk more about, as this volume focuses on, the failures of the German Revolution that are being worked through in the aftermath of the debacle of March 1921 in Germany the legacies of Rosa Luxemburg in that regard, and then look a little bit forward from, from there. As Paul tells us in his summary, there was a current within the Communist International articulated around Gregory Zinoviev in the leadership in Russia, and as Victor Serge will tell us, a thoroughly odious character named Bela Kun, uh, that decided in conjunction with a section of the leadership in the German Communist Party that they would drive the revolution forward voluntaristically. They would organize general strikes and if necessary armed uprisings of small minorities. In some case, they physically confronted the non-communist workers and prevented them from getting into their workplaces as if that's how you build a general strike. Uh, and imagined that this could galvanize and inspire millions into action. It didn't. It was a catastrophic defeat for the party. It cost the party hundreds of thousands of supporters. And in important respects, it disabled it when something approaching a much more genuinely revolutionary situation did emerge two years later uh, in Germany. Now, one of the lessons that comes through here is that when revolutionary radical socialist organizations try to take historical shortcuts, certain kinds of modes of operation come to the fore, particularly bullying. Bela Kuhn was a bully, uh, and you can see that in the report that Paul was talking about. The slogan, win the masses, that 
Trotsky, Lenin in particular, fought for at this Congress of the, uh, the Communist International in 1921 was all about winning and masses. What Gramsci will later call the art of persuasion for communists. That is to say, you actually need to win people uh, to a political perspective to transform society. I would also like to say something about the way in which I think this volume and the immense work that John and Mike have done restore some of the greatness uh, in this historical period of Clara Zetkin. Uh, for many of us on the left, and this includes me when I first came into the left, Zetkin was important as someone who had written about the working class women's movement, who had tried to carve out a particularly Marxist approach to the organizing of working class women. But what emerges here is that that version of history ghettoized Zetkin's contributions. She was an extremely important revolutionary organizer and strategist across the board, and she carried the fight on behalf of those in Germany who opposed the craziness that had almost destroyed their party uh, in 1921. And I think that's hugely important. Similarly, her fight against the expulsion of Paul Levy. Paul Levy, some of you will know, Paul mentioned him, was really with Zetkin, the most important inheritor of Rosa Luxemburg's tradition in the German communist movement. And Levy had played the central role in the transformation of the German communist party into a small mass party. He had undertaken, it, he had led its transformation from an organization of tens of thousands to an organization of hundreds of thousands. And from the get-go, he and Zetkin trained politically by working with Rosa Luxemburg, had understood the madness of trying to ride to revolution via a small minority of the working class movement. And one of the most interesting things about the document is how in this sense, and I say in this sense, Trotsky and Lenin emerge as Luxemburgists. They emerge as people who are saying over and over and over again to the Third Congress of the Communist International, we only fight for political power once we have a majority, once we have won a majority of the working class movement. I'll quote Lenin in, uh, in one of his uh, contributions in the, in the debates. He says, quote, our task is to win a firm Marxist majority, and then we will begin to make the revolution. And that idea of to the masses, meaning that we must win a majority of workers, organized and unorganized, in the home and in the workplaces, and so on, uh, to a Marxist political perspective is, I think, crucial. And really what we're seeing in the case of the German party is that these parties became meaningful, independent mass parties, and not little robot satellites of Moscow. They became meaningful, independent mass parties where there was a fusion of the local working class revolutionary traditions with elements of the Russian experience. But the idea that, as going back to this idea of a textbook, the idea that somehow the Russian Revolution was a magical key to unlock every historical situation was falsified by events. Otherwise, the Russian emissaries would have made revolutions everywhere. In fact, what was required was that the existing revolutionary left find its way to its own local translation and development of what was offered there. And by the way, had I more than one minute left, I would say that you see the same thing with the role that Gramsci plays in the Italian Communist Party. Somebody who had already developed independently a certain kind of political practice in the working class movement in Turin, who then tries to absorb certain lessons of the Russian Revolution to adapt and develop and improve upon that kind of work. And so, I will also make what is in some left circles the controversial claim that Lenin and others did not go far enough. They should have supported Zetkin in opposing the expulsion of Paul Levy. Uh, if anyone deserved to be kicked out of the ranks of the Communist International at that point, it was Bela Kuhn, the little bully. Uh, and that it severely damaged the German party that they didn't support Zetkin's call uh, to oppose that. Having said all of that, it is amazing to read through this. 
to try to process it, particularly for a marginalized left today, the idea that revolutionary socialists once not only thought seriously, but tried to develop strategy and tactics designed to win a majority support for revolutionary socialist politics in the working class movement is hugely important. It goes against every other little shortcut formula uh, that becomes too easy for us today. And I think in bringing this history back to us, Mike and John have done something invaluable in providing legacies from the past that will still, in all kinds of complex ways, speak to our futures. Thank you for that.